Welcome to the Raiders Insider Podcast on NBCSportsCalifornia.com. Introducing your host, Oakland Raiders Insider, Scott Baer. What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Raiders Talk Podcast. It's Friday. Hope you guys enjoyed the Tuesday edition where we really kind of broke down all the question marks surrounding what's going to happen at the cornerback spot. I mean, we were going to go to wide receiver, and we're still going to get to that. But Josh and I kind of brainstormed yesterday and thought of a good idea, kind of break up the uh, the routine of all these position-focused conversations and really try to look at last year's draft class and what we expect and what we, and what we would consider progress from that group entering its second year, the Raiders' first year in Vegas. Uh, we know that draft class was pretty good. Um, so – I didn't do the whole intro thing, but I'm Scott Barry, your host, my co-host Josh Rock on the other side of my screen there, uh, taking care of some of that stuff. But anyway, Josh, let's just get right into it, right? Our, our overall question is, how can this 2019 draft class make progress? How can they build on what they did last year? Before we get to that, what were your impressions of that class's rookie season as a whole? Yeah, I mean, I thought they were obviously outstanding. I thought Every pick, I mean, we know Cleveland had a little bit of a down year, but every pick was basically a home run. They got big contributions from, I mean, almost everyone across the board. Um, I think, I mean, even missing Jonathan Abram, the, the class was still a complete A+, plus, and I think it's going to be a foundational building block for um, a lot of success in the future. And, and there's still this Isaiah Johnson question mark out there too, Jonathan Abrams. So you think in the first four rounds, you missed two of the defensive backs that, that you thought that you were going to have. And ultimately it just continues to build those, um, build out depth and flesh out this roster. I think you and I both agree that, and we've seen free agency be fool's gold within the Raiders organization, right? Trent Brown works with all the money. Maybe uh, Tyra Williams and, and LaMarcus Joyner don't give the initial return for the cash that you want. But if you can stack draft classes, right? Which is why Mike Mayock was, was brought in here, to stack draft classes. That's how you build a team for sustained success. And everybody talks about the foundational draft class, right? Well, and, and we're gonna ask this question at the end, but you look at the 2014 draft class with Carr and Jackson and Mac. And that was looked at as foundational, but it was really like a white hot flash, you know, 15, 16 out because of the coaching change. Uh, Ultimately that may not have been, will this class truly be that foundational draft class? That's what we're going to answer here at the end. But the, before we get into who our favorite draft picks were the best value and some, some numbers that we've kind of, uh, that we can add to each uh, person. This Clemson connection, you, I encourage Raiders fans, go back back to August and listen to Josh's conversation with Dabo Sweeney, Clemson head coach, about the Clemson connection, why he thinks it's so strong, and why do you think that the Raiders go uh, – why do you think that they go after these guys, not only last year, but uh, again this year? Yeah, I think, I mean, from my conversation with, with Dabo, it's just the way he – describe the culture he's built and what he continues to build it's it's hard work it's no nonsense like he he brings in talent obviously but it's not you know it's not like he looks at the top 30 recruits and just offers 30 scholarships right he has to Mm -hmm. he looks at guys like Cleveland Furl and knows when he's talented he's a hard worker he's going to grind and he fits in that culture I think all those guys that's a culture that John Green and Mike Mayock obviously want and they obviously fit in Initial, like immediately and did build start to build that culture and that's why Tanner Muse also and John Simpson were brought in this in this draft class and when and it's not just the Raiders that are into Clemson players that they, they're starting to get like Alabama where they're a fixture and almost a guaranteed lock for maybe three four guys in the first two rounds um, and then a lot of their kind of secondary players uh, um, get, get picked throughout the course of the draft for those reasons that I think it's attractive and to your point a lot of the things that Clemson has done, yeah. the Raiders have not done right. oh, like over a longer period. And I really liked your, your point there that I don't think has been, been brought up anywhere is that he doesn't, that Dabo doesn't just uh, give out scholarships to the top 30 guys. Right. And Mike Mayock keeps talking over and over again. They want to identify Raiders, right? right. They want to identify guys that fit their scheme guys that have their attitude to build that type of program. That's why I think that this connection is so strong and maybe 
for as much as everybody's trying to build it the Patriot way. I'm not trying to say they're building it the Clemson way. It's a different level, different yeah, me- method of recruiting players. But I think that you can have some similar um, philosophies. Yeah, and I, well, I think when I when I talked to Dabo, uh, the first thing he brought up and that I asked him about was when he took over at Clemson in 2008 as an interim coach. I mean, they were basically, if you think about it, they were pretty much a laughing stock, right? They were the team that was always really talented, always fell on its face. And he mm-hmm. was like, you know, when I took over, it was all about just changing that attitude, changing that the way people looked at us and the way we viewed ourselves. I think that's what the Raiders also are trying to do um, with John Green retake out. This whole conversation sounds like a Josh Schrock column special. Uh, now that we're getting into it, lots of interesting stuff uh, from you. Now, let's kind of go into kind of our, our our categories when you look at this draft class. And we're not going to do a ton, but who do you think uh, was the best draft pick, um, especially in especially in his rookie year? and maybe the position he plays, uh, where do you stand there? I'm sure it's going to be a real shock to regulars of this podcast. Maybe you get right it. It. I'm, I'm going to go with Trayvon Mullen. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's, I mean, it's pretty much a layup for me. I just think I look at it from a couple of different ways. One, it's, it's a position in cornerback where you see a lot of guys come in and struggle and then just wash out, right? Mm-hmm. They get cooked like Trayvon Mullen did in week one, and they're like, man, I don't have it. And then it never materializes. And for him, he was like, hey, I'm good. I know I'm bad. It's okay. And then when he got a starting job in week nine, he played really well. We've talked about the issues, the penalties. He had 10 penalties, three in one game. Uh, but still, I mean, an 85.7 QBR against. And I think he just showed that he's a foundational piece of that secondary going forward. And that's a, I mean, that's a huge position of need in today's NFL. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that that passer rating against says a lot about it considering – and we're going to talk about what, how he can improve in year two later, but 40 receptions on 69 targets. That's a, that's a pretty good number for somebody so young. Again, he's long and he fits everything uh, that the Raiders try uh, to do. And I'm sure that this will be no shock uh, who I'm going to pick for my best pick. Uh, the guy that I hold in the same esteem that you hold Trayvon uh, it's running back Josh Jacobs. I, he just, I just like the way that he plays football. He's just, uh, he's tough. He's hard nosed. He's not afraid of you or anything else. He can be physical and elusive in that physical way, right? He's not going to be Barry Sanders and do a pirouette around you. He's going to run through you. He might Emmett Smith slash through you. And the thing that I always, how I determine a good running back is can you take a carry that when you watch it on tape should have been two yards? and you make it four, right? And you do that enough, you're going to move the chains and you're going to score. And I think Josh Jacobs is very good at that. He's got some home run capability. I don't think we ever saw him score, you know, a 60-yard touchdown. But if you can take 20-yard chunks or, again, turn two to four, four to eight, and maybe an eight to a 20, then that's what I think makes you a pretty good running back. He, uh, 1300 yards total offense we'll get into his reception total later on only 20 of those but still I, I think some somebody that could be a real foundational piece and that's not to argue that you're wrong by picking Trayvon I think both of us can be right because of the depth um, of this draft class now let's move on down the line I picked a first round pick you picked a second round pick and a higher second round pick at number 40. So what about best value? Uh, what do you think there? And you've got some options. Yeah, I got a little bit of options, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm building a house in death Valley. I don't know if you've heard. <laughs> yeah, I have. I'm a fan of uh, everything that goes on down there. Uh, so I'm going to go with Hunter Renfro. Mm-hmm. Um, I Makes think sense. on brand. <laughs> very on brand for me. I think after, uh, after week eight in that Texans game, he really, he really found his groove. Him and Derek found a really good chemistry and connection He's a great third down weapon. And once again, like cornerback, slot receiver is just a, it's something you need in today's NFL. You need that guy who on third and five is going to get you seven and is going to, you know, you can fire fastball and it's going to stick in his hands. And Hunter Renfro, he's got great hands. He's a good route runner. And I think that chemistry with Derek Carr makes him so vital. And I mean, fifth round pick, we, I thought he was going to be good initially. I didn't think he was going to be that good. Um, so that's my best value. And th- there is, as you and I were kind of digging through numbers here, one kind of stood out to me that maybe I never paid attention to, right? That his average yards after catch, 6.4, right? His total yards per reception, 
right? So his depth of target is pretty shallow, right? But he's still able to get more off of that. Now, did he turn and burn one for what, 70 in Houston that may have stacked that number? Yeah, okay. But the, the point of the matter is, is he's, he's able to take a shorter depth of field target and turn it into something. And that's what I think is cool. Uh, towards the end of the season when he really got hot, he had four games of a passer rating when he was targeted above 138. Yeah. He had a total – Derek was 114. That's higher than his average throwing to Hunter Renfro. And QBR – not QBR, sorry. Passer rating isn't just about – completion percentage it's about touchdowns and what you do and ch uh, chunks and stuff like that he had two games that he had one game at 158.3 that game in houston where we were saying he had that big um yards after catch i'm ranting about numbers now uh my pick probably no surprise to anyone either uh is is, is max crosby sec he was a runner-up for rookie of the year as a fourth round pick out of a small school who supposedly couldn't stop the run right now he's a three down player 29 run stops 10 you know uh, 10 sacks that kind of speaks for itself we can get to how he can improve later but you get that kind of a guy um at that point in the fourth round just like you got renfro in the fifth round right that that's what makes a draft class truly dynamic i'm not saying it's easy to pick somebody at 24 or 40 but i think it's easier to find the right a real talented guy there than it is in the hundreds, you know? And I, I mean, I think, I think part of Max's value to me at least is that as good as he was early, that took a little bit of the pressure off Cleveland. Right. right? Because you at least they had, the Raiders had one rookie edge rusher who was immediately very impactful. Not that Cleveland wasn't, wasn't good, but mm -hmm. I think Max being as good as he was did take a little bit of pressure off Cleveland. Yeah. Cause even though there were three first round draft picks, two of them active last year, being the number four guy, right? I mean, I remember the first in, back in 2014 when when uh, Mac was the fifth fifth pick, fifth pick, um, and he only he didn't have a sack for like I don't know eight weeks or a, like a long stretch, and he kept getting asked when like like when's that sack coming? When's it coming? Just just constantly on him. Maybe not grading on him. He doesn't. He's oblivious to that stuff. But I'm saying that he was a major topic because he was a top level draft pick, the only guy on kind of a crappy team, a very crappy team, and uh, that that's part of it. And so to your point, I think that Klee kind of um, maybe un under wasn't that level of scrutiny, even though just from you and I knowing him, and we'll get to him here, um, really with the next question as we move into this portion of the podcast um, where, okay, so that's what they did. And that's what we liked about their rookie years. Move it forward. What do we, how do we think they can back to our original question? How can they improve on last year's campaign and what are signs of progress? It's not always numbers. It doesn't always mean Cleveland's going to be the sack leader and Max Crosby is going to be a defensive player of the year but how can we identify progress what's appropriate what's rational so let's start with the number four overall pick um cleveland furl last year four and a half sacks um three hits 18 total pressures five pass breakups he you know he moved inside and out right uh and uh, 21 run stops his, his highest grade was on defense in, per pro football focus and it was pretty high almost 70 um but uh, maybe give us a quick rundown of what you thought last year and then kind of spring us forward uh, to what you expect. Yeah. I mean, I thought he was, he was, he was decent. Um, like I said, not for the, for the number four overall pick, the, the numbers weren't there. The production probably wasn't there. We know he battled the illness. He lost weight, mm -hmm. moved inside, was asked to do a lot. Um, I, I expect, I mean, we've talked about it. We expect him to make a, make a leap this year. We know he's a hard worker. Um, I think, I'm looking at, you know, at least uh, maybe maybe three or four sack increase, but I think the pressures and the hits is where he really, where we'll see the improvement, right? It's okay if he's not the guy who brings down the quarterback, but we're going to want those pressures to go up to, you know what, Max had 45 last year, maybe 45, 50, get some more hits and at least, at least you know, help, help out other people um, on that defense get sacks, kind of like Malik Collins does, right? He's not a big sack number guy, but he, he forces a lot of adjusted sacks. So right. I think the pressures is where we want to see the, the improvement. Yeah, and, and that's a key thing, pressures, pressures, pressures. And the, I think run defense may be his calling card. I think it's going to help him 
you, you brought up Collins, that that's a great point. Um, if he gets to play a lot on third downs, I'm curious to see his pass rush opportunities in right. terms of Carl Nassib joining the crew now, um, how that all kind of shakes out. I think they have enough interior depth that who knows what they'll do mid season, but I would anticipate him staying at end. I think that's better for him. I think he would prefer that even though he would never say it. And I, I, I loved the attitude and the press conference that or press meeting or whatever that he had the last day of the year when he said, guys, I'm going to come back a different player, right? He, that, that, you always see this jump between year one and, and year two because you can really work out. You can really grind. I know this offseason is, off is weird, but he's been working out with Eric Armstead and DeForest Buckner, and those guys, take, those guys are, are pretty good. So I, I think that's been positive. I, th- I do expect that. I like that, that I feel like your sack total was pretty rational, yeah. you know, two or three up. And if he can be a seven or eight sack guy and play lights out run defense, fine, yeah. right? there's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, I think that that's a, uh, that's a pretty good thing. But again, to, to your point, creating pressures, right? That maybe if, if he can finish better, but I think the pressures will help him grow, right? Then we can talk about year three. Already he had 45 pressures. Well, let's see 10 sacks, right? And then you can keep ratcheting it up um, and uh, keep building for this kid. Again, hard worker, Mike Mayock didn't draft him number four for no reason. Right. Um, so I, I think that fans need to trust that and maybe understand that this is a process for some people, you know, and now I'm just going off on a tangent, but maybe while Crosby helped take the spotlight off, he also maybe kind of set a tough standard because he's a rookie. He had 10 sacks and you can look over and be like, well, our number four guy didn't have that. So it's about being yourself. Maybe when fans look at him, you ignore all the other stuff and see what like what kind of progress um, is he making. When it comes to protecting your business, Bay Alarm brings the best. Like being on duty 24-7, 365, no matter what. Putting burglars out of business, just like they've been doing for over 70 years. It's one more way Bay Alarm puts the pro in protection. Because if your security's not the best, you're not secure. Go to bayalarm.com slash NBC Sports for a special offer to all new business customers. Now, more than ever, Bay Alarm. ACO 28 TCL 880138. Now here's the unknown. This is it's hard to make a comparison because in terms of Jonathan Abram, the number 27 overall pick out of Texas AM. Uh Mississippi what? Mississippi State. Mississippi State, thank you so much. Uh, the logos always mess me up. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much for that. But yeah, um, what do you anticipate uh, for him? It, it's kind of an unknown, but how about this question then? What would be a good season for him, given everything that he's gone through, missing most of his rookie year? I, like I said, it's really, hard. it's really hard to tell. Let's start with 16 games played. Okay, that's a good start. <laughs> stay, stay healthy, get a full year under your belt. Um, obviously we're going to look for the aggressiveness to be there, but tailored back under control harnessed. Um, I think a lot of the things that the Raiders like from Jonathan Abram, that they want to see, I mean, you're not going to see the statutes, right? They like the intangibles. They like the leadership, they like the toughness, the tone setting. Um, so it's all that, that's what we're going to really look for. I think it's going to be style of play more than numbers based. Right. Yeah. Like more than a particular number of pressures or a particular number of picks or Right. And I think another unknown, the reason why we can't just write out a stat line right now is we don't have a great idea how he's going to be used. I think we assume he's going to be more of a box safety and how Demarius Randall or whoever plays free safety will play into that. All these things are, I would anticipate him being more aggressive, more of a run defender, but you just ultimately don't know how it's going to shake out because we don't have a lot of evidence. Um, So I think for all those reasons, it is a big question mark. I think if he comes in and makes an impact like the guys we've already talked about, a Crosby, Renfro, Mullen, Jacobs type impact anywhere in that range, I think that you're really happy. Right. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, okay, so let's, let's, let's move on here. Uh, we're kind of not just going straight on down the line in terms of draft order, but with Hunter Renfro, how is he going to fit 
in a wide receiver core that has undergone a dramatic change. Last year, especially towards the end with Ty- Tyra Williams being hurt, mm-hmm. it was like him and Darren Waller were the receiving options. Yeah. Now he fits in with Ruggs, who's going to play some slot. Waller can play some slot. Brian Edwards is going to fit in somewhere. Lynn Bowden's going to fit in somewhere, maybe in the slot sometimes. Okay. How is he going to fit in um, to everything that's going on? Yeah, no, I mean, look, they've completely revamped the offense, a lot of weapons, but I think, I think Renfro is going to fit in great, first of all, because of that chemistry with Derek Carr, right? We know how much that means to Derek. I mean, you drop a, like you've talked about, you drop a pass in practice, Derek's not going to forget it, right? And obviously he trusts Hunter more than most people in this core because they have that chemistry. So I think, I think Hunter's going to fit in great. You have a guy like Ruggs, they're going to move him all over, all over the place. We know Tyrell's going to be on the outside uh, in one – uh, on one side, uh, Brian Edwards, he's talented. He can play a big slot, but I, I do expect him to have a, a toned down role uh, in the rookie season just because the OTAs and the foot issue. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, th- I think Hunter's going to fit in great. I think he's the exact kind of weapon. I don't think anyone else on this receiving court does what he does well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, uh, he, and you're right. He, he has that kind of defined and maybe not specialized role, but I, I think he does fit in. And it's still going to be, right, a third and Renfro type of situation, despite the fact that they have Jason Witten, obviously different players, but he's another third and four option. I just think that with these weapons that we're talking about and attention having to be paid to Ruggs' speed, right, and Witten's veteran, uh, veteran savvy when he's in the game and Waller in the middle of the field and Williams or whoever is playing outside, that especially, you know, if you're – playing zone there, there's going to be holes no matter what a defensive coverage is there there's going to be holes and opportunities for him and to your point with the chemistry already built with the lack of otas to build some uh, some of that chemistry with the new guys not saying Derek Carr is going to go to rugs also minor note and not a major note but Hunter has been in Las Vegas for a long time. He and Alec Ingold and Derek Carr and Zay Jones and those guys have been working out together a lot. We've seen on social media, Derek Carr's playing golf with Hunter Renfro now that the courses are open. Um, so I, to your point, I think the, the established chemistry and the trust in what he did at the end of the year, all those numbers that we threw at, at you were, are super impressive, um, is really going to help him, especially early on if he continues that. Uh, you know, I think that's all going to fit. Uh, we, we talked a bit about this with our bold predictions a couple weeks ago with Josh Jacobs. Can he hit 1,500 yards? Um, so we don't have to get super into that. But, you know, in terms of signs of progress, it, let's maybe focus in on the receptions maybe, or where do you see signs of progress? Let's just make it open-ended. Um, yeah. Is there a statistical total? You want to see him do more of something? What's the what's – I mean, I'd, I'd love to see more receptions. I mean, I, we saw him. He was a big pass-catching weapon at Alabama. We saw his hands in training camp. I remember a couple one-handed grabs where everyone was talking about, you know, fantasy football values going to be through the roof with receptions, and it never really materialized. But it's not it's not because he doesn't have the ability. So I think, I think adding that dimension to this offense is going to make them even more potent and more explosive. Um, so I, I would like to see him just get more involved as a pass-catching back. Yeah, and I think that's going to be – possible it's just crazy when you think about all these weapons not just the second year guys but uh you know if Bowden finds a role there if Jalen um Richard is gonna fit in somewhere that there's just a lot of people who are gonna want the ball and it's up to John Gruden and Derek Carr to get it to him and to foster that team first mentality that even though maybe the stats and this is just generally speaking that if the stats aren't super high for some of these skill players that they're still productive one thing I do think is Josh Jacobs is going to see a high carry count and for him maybe a sign of progress and I'm nitpicking here but you know he's super aggressive he's like he got hurt when he laid out uh, uh, Adrian Amos right the 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 Packer safety just put a shoulder in him just knocked him down pancake style maybe there's a little bit of that Jonathan Abram moment where it's like okay have that club in your bag but don't pull it out every time, right? Yeah. Treat it like a three iron, you know, like use it in very specific locations. Right. Uh, uh, but anyway, so I'm not sure if that exposed that I don't know golf, 
uh, but uh, nonetheless, just you know, tr just try to be smart with it uh, is my point. Yeah. Um, okay. Let, let's see. Let's let's move on here real quick. Uh, Foster uh, Moreau's role with Jason Witten here. Mm -hmm. There's a somewhat of a known and an unknown about his health status and maybe what it'll be in the summer. That's going to be determined, I think, once we see how he does. Um, there isn't a lot of news on that right now. Um, we didn't really discuss his numbers, but here's just a, a, a couple that I thought were staggering, is that he had 21 receptions on drum roll, please, 23 targets. He caught the ball every time it was thrown to him, safe two, and he didn't have any drops. So maybe two were just errant or throwaways that got counted for him. So that's pretty impressive. And 174 yards, but five touchdowns, a good red zone target, not used a lot in the receiving game. Um, 14 of his went for first downs, just to use every number that I wrote down here. <laughs> uh, but how does he fit in with, with Jason Witten here, again, with the unknown variable of his health? Yeah, as long as he's healthy, I expect – I mean, I expect the – I mean, John Gruden said he's going to use two and three tight ends. I expect Foster Moreau to get a lot of looks. He's a valuable red zone weapon, a valuable third down weapon. And I think Jason Witten being on this team is only going to help his growth as a tight end, right? That's why Jason Witten's here, not only to be valuable on third down in the red zone, but also just be a leader for this team and help Foster and Darren Waller grow as, as NFL tight ends. Yeah, and I think Foster even said on Instagram or something like that that – that Jason Witten was one of his role models when he was going through high school and college. And when you get in a room with a role model, right. And you see that they're, you know, a real person and how they work and you can emulate that um, and kind of dream about attaining the type of success that that guy you're now talking to um, kind of works with. I, I think that that's always key. I, I love hearing those stories about, Jonathan Abram talked about LaMarcus Joyner in this way, and he's not the only one where in college they watch tape of guys that they're now playing with and how that can be constructive because you looked at it from an academic level and then you look at it in real time right in front of your eyes. And I do think um, that can be valuable. Okay, moving right along here. Can Isaiah Johnson make up for his lost season? He wasn't completely lost. He was around for about half the year but he never really got caught up. That's what happens to rookies when you miss so much time because of the facial fracture. And I mean, imagine that facial fracture to, to, to get over that and to get back into it. But can he get into the mix? We talked a little bit, a lot about him last week, but uh, what's going to be key for him early on to get kind of back up to speed and show that he's ready to go and, and uh, compete for playing time. Yeah. I think I look at it kind of the same way. I look at Jonathan Abram, right? We really don't know, what to expect. I mean, he was around for eight weeks, but we didn't see a lot of him play. Um, we know he's recently converted cornerback, so working on technique, but I do think the year in Paul Gunther's system is going to help him out. And I, I do expect him to compete for the job. I think Prince Mukamara and Damon Arnett obviously have a leg up, but I mean, the Raiders like Isaiah Johnson. They think he's talented. He's got all, he's the prototypical Raider corner that we talk about. He's long, athletic. Um, so I, I don't know if he can get it back, but um, I'm, I'm certainly interested to see how he looks come, come training camp. And uh, Trayvon Mullen, two-part question for you. Uh, how did he figure it out so fast from an NFL level? I mean, you wrote about him kind of doing that, right? The, 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 the Denver game and kind of how he figured it out. And so how did he kind of figure it out? And then what's next um, for him? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the figuring out part for him was, I think, just – realizing initially after that week one game the speed of the game and mm -hmm. he I remember him telling me you know hey I, I know I'm really good so I'm not worried about getting beat I just have to get I just have to get back to work and Paul Gunther talked about him cleaning up his technique a little bit which he did I think um, through the first five or six weeks until he took the starting job um, he, he's just he's a supremely talented guy and he's a really hard worker uh, and what's next for him is the sky's the limit right we gotta he's got to cut down on the penalties got to stop reaching but all the numbers are there were there in limited sample size. So I, I expect a really big year, a really big year from him. And I think he's, a, he can be a pro bowl corner if he makes the right leap. Uh, and the last uh, draft pick we haven't really talked about is uh, Max Crosby. And when I look at his numbers, right, 10 sacks on 45 total pressures mm -hmm. and the Nick Bosa comparison is let's throw that out, but I'm going to, I'm going to mention Nick for this one reason, right? Nick had, 
was widely and almost universally perceived to have had a better rookie season. I'm not going to argue that. I agree with that point. But Nick Bosa had nine sacks on, I'm pulling off the top of my head now, like 82 pressures, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a lot of pressure. Okay. Now let's compare it to Max Crosby had 10 sacks on 45 pressures, which tells me the man knows how to finish. Okay. So if you take that kind of percentage of pressures to sacks, that's incredible. I mean, it's just incredible. So if he can ratchet up the pressures, Mm -hmm. then you think that sack total can go really, really high. Or even if it stays at 10 or 11, 60 pressures, 70 pressures, right. Then you're seeing more of what he was already able to do. And he turned it on. There were some games where he was unstoppable. The home game against the LA Chargers could not be stopped. He abused that reserve tackle in a way that you rarely see from a rookie fourth round pick. So I think for him, it's about doing it over. And I'm sure that in his mind, he hears the, you know, freakish fluky thing, Uh, you know, um, you know, like in those types of, things going through his head or you got to do it again. Now Uh, I think that he, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that he can do it again. I, he had 29 run stops once he became a, um, more of a three down end. I thought he was really good. Maybe giving him some rest with, with Carl Nassim going back and forth, maybe could definitely help him as well. Uh, cause Carl can play the run somewhat. Benson Mayo could not (laughs) So even just, sorry, no offense, Benson hard to argue, but, uh, but nonetheless, um, that's how I think that he can get better. It's just ramp up those total pressures. Even if the sacks stay the same, that doesn't mean that it can be the same season. Uh, I would anticipate him growing also because he's going to be more of an impact and have a bigger role from the start as opposed to really week five, week four slash five when it uh, kicked in for him. Sure. And okay. Crystal ball time yeah. just for fun. I guess, because uh, these are hard questions, and I'm sure the commenters will hold us to it, and that's fine. Uh, uh, who and we we didn't like assign players previously, but who has the best year? That's impossible to evaluate. They all play different positions, um, but who do you think has a real? How about this? Who do you think has a real standout year? Whether it's a repeat or you know, uh, really kind of shines in their first year in in uh, Vegas. I'm going to go with Cleveland Pearl. I like it. I like it. I think he's – I mean, he, we know he's motivated. He's talented. Uh, I remember talking to him last year prior to prior to the Texans game after he just got out of his illness, and he told me, you know, great, great players aren't great until they become great. And I was like, okay, I guess, that, I guess, you know, I guess that, that's true, right? Uh, so I expect, I expect big things from him. I think he, hears, he heard all the noise. Um, and I think his friendship with Max Crosby, a competitive friendship, uh, will only help uh, to make him make it better. I'm so glad that you said Furrow because then that allows me to just steal your guy and take Trayvon Mullen because uh, I think that he's another one of these hard worker types. And I think the interception count yes. will uptick. Now, he, it, I was going to say it depends on his level of targets, but – I, I think that those types of game-changing plays can could make him stand out. We we've seen that he can cover. We've seen that he's confident and and plays aggressive and can kind of. Uh, we both think that he can tone that down. If the interception count kicks up, then we can really see his true kind of impact. Now, we've seen a lot of guys. Byron Jones is one get paid without a lot of picks, yeah. um, and that's fine. But I, I think that he has a chance to use his ball skills and kind of crank that up. Uh, that, so I guess my, the next question was who shows the most improvement, but that kind of ties in with kind of what you were saying with, um, with, uh, you know, Cleveland. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm really interested how, how Jonathan Abram is like going to step in there, you know, shows most improvement that, that, that doesn't really fit, um, necessarily, but I think that we will see guys improve. And again, it's not about stats necessarily. It's about their, the size of their role and their impact whether like what you were saying, you know, interceptions forced, those things count too. Right. Coaches put a plus next to your name. If you make the pressure that causes an inadvertent throw that Trayvon Mullen gets, maybe Cleveland Furl gets partial credit uh, for that. And I think that those types of things are what can kind of make this uh, draft class really dynamic. 
Um, and and I, I do think I do think as far as improvement goes, not that he had a bad rookie year, but I think Hunter Renfro is going to take another leap just from the improved, I mean, the maximized role, right? He came on halfway through the season, full year, full offseason work with Derek Carr. I expect, I expect him to have a really big year. Yeah, and I, I think that that, you know, is a pretty good observation. 49 receptions, right, given that he is that chemistry guy. And I'd love to see, you know, if he has a full 16 – game regular season what his first down count would be right. you know whether it's a five yard catch on third and four or what have you I, I think his first down rate is going to be pretty high um and now kind of going back to what we were talking about at, at, at the top as we wrap this thing up uh is we talked about the 2014 draft class as a flash in the pan and this is a crystal ball thing because it's all about what happens in the future but well, this draft class, do you think, go down as a truly foundational one, as the start of a run of sustained success? Now, again, that's up to the GM and the head coach, too. But does this talent base, do you think it has a chance to lift this franchise up? Oh, yeah. I mean, no doubt. I think uh, not only from what they've done on the field, I think that locker room culture that they've obviously helped to build and are going to continue to build is important. And I think making picks at crucial positions and having them all really pan out edge rusher, slot receiver, cornerback. We expect Jonathan to be good safety. That's all very important to being a really talented and successful football team down the road in two and three years when these guys are established pros. So I think, I think as long as John Gruden and Mike Mayock can follow through on what they've been doing, this class will be seen as the start of, of something great. Yeah. It- my only thought against what you said, not that I disagree, is that normally foundational draft classes generally include a quarterback, right. uh, and this one doesn't because they still have Derek Carr. Now, that's not to say they should have drafted a quarterback this year or last year. Not saying that. I'm just saying that that's kind of what you think about prototypically. But if Derek Carr can step up and have the year like what you wrote in your last column on him, that you think this could be a huge year for him, if, if he can do that, then I think this – could kind of elevate that group um, and really kind of keep it going. Now, again, it's all about stacking draft classes, but if they have another good one, like we think that they have um, with Ruggs and, uh, you know, Bowden and Edwards and all those guys and the two cornerbacks, then it could be the start of something special because this group has learned, this group wasn't bad. It's seven and nine, right? And if you kind of keep taking those incremental leaps, if you get to nine, and then you can live in the nine and 10 area for three or four years. In, right. Then you're getting in the tournament three or four, maybe three times out of four seasons and you've got a shot. Right. And that's all that you can ask for is can you have a shot? Can you get hot? Like the 49ers did, like the chiefs did like teams in the past um, where you can get hot and just win three or four games and win the whole thing. Yeah, I, I mean, I will say to your point about foundational classes and quarterbacks, I think the, the one thing that's never really talked about with Derek Carr is the Raiders having him enabled them to have this draft class because they didn't have to go out and draft a quarterback, right? No matter what you think about Derek Carr, when, you, when teams rebuild, almost always they come in and they're like, man, I don't, we don't have a quarterback, and they have to use a top pick on a guy who may or may not be good. But having a guy like Derek Carr who is – you know, he's polarizing, but he is an above-average NFL quarterback allowed John Gruden and Mike Mayock to address every other aspect of the roster and have this class. That is a really good point. Yeah, because maybe you have to give up, you know, four and 24 to get to one or two to get the guy that you want. Yeah. Um, so that is a really good point, that having him there has allowed John Gruden and Mike Mayock, I'm changing my thinking as I'm talking, to, to lay the foundation because I didn't have to worry about that super expensive guy um, while they were doing it. And then no matter what happens down the road, then you have the foundation. A young guy can either come in and be uh, steps ahead of the game, a la what Dak Prescott and some of these other guys have enjoyed, or Derek Carr takes off like a rocket ship and they can keep building and fleshing and then you've really got something special. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say, Josh, I'm, I'm going to slap a five-star review on that podcast right there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was definitely a fun one. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it as much as we did, uh, kind of looking back and looking ahead. And we're going to keep on doing this thing, man. Uh, thank you guys so much for all the positive comments on YouTube. You know how to subscribe on everywhere you can find us, audio, video, you name it. This is a multimedia endeavor. Josh, thank you so much for the time and for the breakdown.
Thank you. Raiders Insider Podcast on NBCSportsCalifornia.com.